This video deals with the tax treatment of capital gains. I'm Leandra Letterman, and I'm really pleased to have a co-host today. I'm Emily Cobble, and it's time to break into tax. The U.S. federal income tax has both a limitation on the deductibility of capital losses and a capital gains preference for individuals. This video deals with the capital gains preference. In the case of capital gains, there is preferential tax treatment for what is called net capital gain. Section 1H, which you see here, tells you that lower rates can potentially apply to net capital gain. Sometimes the lower rate is 0%, sometimes it's 15%, and sometimes it is 20%, or in other cases, rates of 25% or 28% may apply as well. What you can see here is that the 0, 15, and 20% rates all apply to what's called adjusted net capital gain, which is underlined and in blue type here. The 25 and 28% rates, by contrast, apply to certain types of net capital gain that do not qualify as adjusted net capital gain. These rates also are progressive, so that the 0%, 15%, and 20% apply at increasing amounts of taxable income. So it's possible for that adjusted net capital gain to span more than one of the brackets. So some might be taxed at 0% and some at 15%, or some at 15% and some at 20%. Where the brackets fall changes from year to year. But it's a little bit easier to illustrate that if we think about a taxpayer who only has adjusted net capital gain as the only component of their taxable income. So let's take a look at a simple example involving that scenario. So in this example, for the 2022 tax year, the taxpayer has $112,950 of adjusted net capital gain, and that's the taxpayer's only tax-related event for the year. No other income no deductions other than the standard deduction. So when you compute the taxpayer's taxable income, it comes to $100,000. And if we look at the breakpoints in the 0%, 15%, and 20% brackets for tax year 2022, we see that the 100,000 of taxable income, all comprised of adjusted net capital gain, spans the 0% and part of the 15% brackets. And the breakpoint between the two brackets is $41,675. So the first $41,675 is taxed at a zero rate. And then the amount between the $41,675 and the $100,000, $58,325, is taxed at a 15% rate. The tax on that is. $8,748.75. So that is the taxpayer's tax liability for 2022 on these facts. We should also note that in some cases, an additional 3.8% tax might apply to individual taxpayers if their adjusted gross income exceeds certain threshold amounts. So I always recommend putting the capital gains and capital losses into a two by two grid. So this assumes that you've correctly characterized any gains or losses as capital and you've determined the holding period as long-term or short-term. You put the long-term capital gain in one box, short-term capital gain in another, long-term capital loss in a third box and the short-term capital loss in another box. So I recommend always starting with adding up the capital losses across the bottom and adding the capital gains across the top. And if the capital losses exceed the capital gains, you will not have a net capital gain except possibly for qualified dividend income. But if the losses do not exceed the capital gains, then you have the potential to have a net capital gain in addition to any qualified dividend income. As we saw in section 1H, the preferential rates of 0%, 15%, and 20% apply to adjusted net capital gain. Adjusted net capital gain is defined as the sum of 
net capital gain with certain adjustments, plus qualified dividend income. Net capital gain in turn is defined in section 1222. So section 1222 doesn't have the subsections labeled A, B, and C. Instead, it's just got numbered subsections. And section 1222.11 defines net capital gain. The term net capital gain means the excess of the net long-term capital gain for the taxable year over the net short-term capital loss for the year. So that's what we're gonna be looking at in the examples is how much net capital gain or excess of net long-term capital gain over net short-term capital loss the taxpayer has. Net capital gain is defined in section 1222, as we saw, as the excess of net long-term capital gain over net short-term capital loss. So to get that from this grid, you subtract down the left to get net long-term capital gain, and you subtract up the right, meaning you take the excess of short-term capital loss over short-term capital gain to get the net short-term capital loss and then the excess of that net long-term capital gain over the net short-term capital loss is your net capital gain before qualified dividend income, and then you add the qualified dividend income to get the aggregate net capital gain. Let's turn to a first example. Let's say the taxpayer has 10,000 of long-term capital gain, zero of short-term capital gain, 4,000 of long-term capital loss, and 5,000 of short-term capital loss. To determine their net long-term capital gain, you're subtracting down the left-hand side, so the excess of long-term capital gain over long-term capital loss. That gives you $6,000 as their net long-term capital gain. Their net short-term capital loss is the excess of short-term capital loss over short-term capital gain. So the excess of the 5,000 over zero gives you 5,000, that's their net short-term capital loss. Then their net capital gain is the excess of that net long-term capital gain of 6,000 over the net short-term capital loss of 5,000. So the excess of 6,000 over 5,000 or 1,000 would be their net capital gain and you would add to that any qualified dividend income that they had, which in this example, we're assuming is zero. In order to have net capital gain, other than just based on qualified dividend income, the way that the definitions work, you need to have at least some long-term capital gain. If you don't have long-term capital gain, you're not gonna have net capital gain, except if there's qualified dividend income. Let's do an example that shows what happens if you add more short-term capital gain to that prior example. So the prior example had zero of short-term capital gain. In this example, the numbers are the same as in the prior example, except that we've added $5,000 of short-term capital gain. And let's see what happens. So here, our net long-term capital gain is the excess of 10,000 over 4,000. That's still $6,000 as in the prior example. But when we get to the net short-term capital loss and the excess of the short-term capital loss over the short-term capital gain, here that's zero. 5,000 exceeds 5,000 by zero. So the net short-term capital loss here is zero. So when we look at the excess of the net long-term capital gain of 6,000 over the net short-term capital loss of zero, we get $6,000 as our net capital gain. And again, there's no qualified dividend income to add to that. So notice that the difference in this example from the previous one is that there's $6,000 of net capital gain in this example where there was only $1,000 of net capital gain in the prior example. So adding short-term capital gain actually increased the amount of net capital gain by the amount of that gain because it absorbed $5,000 of the short-term capital losses, thus increasing the amount of 
the long-term capital gain that's taxed at the preferential rates applicable to net capital gain. So in an example like this, where the short-term capital gain is at least as much as the short-term capital loss, you'll have a zero for net short-term capital loss. And that will mean that the net capital gain is equal to what you see when you subtract down the left, the excess of the long-term capital gain over the long-term capital loss. But that only works in an example where you have at least as much short-term capital gain as short-term capital loss. In this next example, we keep all of the facts the same, except we assume the taxpayer also has $2,000 of qualified dividend income. So they will still have $6,000 of net long-term capital gain, the excess of their $10,000 of long-term capital gain over $4,000 long-term capital loss. They'll still have zero of net short-term capital loss because there's no excess of short-term capital loss over short-term capital gain. So setting aside qualified dividend income, they would still have $6,000 of net capital gain. But then we take that $6,000 and add $2,000 of qualified dividend income to it to determine that they actually have $8,000 that's subject to tax at favorable rates. This has been the Capital Gains Preference. Thank you for joining us as you break into tax. Please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the Break Into Tax YouTube channel, and turn on notifications so you know immediately when we drop a new video.